Yeah, my name's Brian Martin, and I'm sorry about the, my little biography on the front. It looks as if I'm an absolute know-all. <laughs> it isn't the case, it's so long. Um, yeah, I, Wollstone Eyes, most of you probably know where it is. I, I know many other people here do. For those who don't, it's two miles east of Warrington Town Centre. Um, and I first came across Wollstone Eyes when I moved from Northumberland, where my wife and I had lived for many years in the late 1970s. I looked at an OS map one day and I thought, that area looks quite interesting, and wandered down there and um, went into one of the deposit grounds, because the, the land is all owned by the Manchester Ship Canal and been used for depositing dredgings for many years. I climbed up onto one of the embankments of number four deposit ground and the first birds that I saw on my Wollstone list were two flamingos. <laughs> and I thought, this place looks interesting. <laughs> and uh, I was hooked from then on. Um, and I met two or three other people, three other people during the subsequent months down there. Um, one of them, Brian Ankers, who's now our chairman, has been our chairman from um, when the group was formed. And two other people, and that formed the nucleus of what was the Wollstone Eyes, became rather the Wollstone Eyes Conservation Group. Um, what we did from the beginning was decided that we were going to record everything that we saw. There had been some preliminary work done by a group called the Warrington Newtown Conservation Group um, in the early 70s and they did survey work there and um, we carried on doing that and we presented the Manchester Ship Canal Company um, with a report in I think it was 1979-80 and we were invited to a meeting in the extraordinary oak panelled boardroom of Ship Canal Company in the centre of Manchester um, and with the hope but not expectation that they would allow us to do some conservation work on the site. Um, and much to our surprise when we walked in and sat down there was the, um, not the chairman of the company, chief executive of the company at the time and some of his advisors and their um, one of their land managers, and before we actually said anything, um, they said that um, we've read your report, very impressed by it, and yes, um, we think um, that would be fine. You, c you can go on and manage it. What I didn't know at the time, discovered later, that the chief executive of the company then was a very close friend of Sir Peter Scott's, and had been on expeditions with him to the Arctic ringing geese. Um, he always said later that that in no way influenced his decision, but I, I suspect it did. <laughs> Manchester Ship Canal, built in 1894, um, I think officially opened by Queen Victoria in uh, May of that year. Um, legal requirement to dredge and prevent flooding, yes, there's not much dredging goes on now. Um, when I first went there in the 70s, um, the ship can have their own in-house dredging team and they work daily. And they created some lovely habitats there by putting lots of silt on the teal and masses of waders. I can remember going down and seeing three or four hundred Dunlin and up to 700 snipe. 700 snipe, that's what a faint memory now, isn't it? Um, we're on those deposit grounds. Um, we concentrated our efforts, which we still do, on number three deposit ground, which was last used for dredgings in 1970, I think. We started doing management work there in a very low-key way because we didn't have much money, basically. Um, we, bird watchers got to know the site. Um, strangely, very few people had bird watched there or than any interest in the site, apart from one or two people who I later discovered had records. Um, and we, um, we were doing, there was very little open water there because this succession phase had started to take place. Um, and there was just masses of reed mace, very little open water, and not much of interest. 
added to which there was a shooting party there, mainly composed of Warrington policemen who went down and blasted away at anything that moved um, during the winter months. Um, but part of this meeting that we'd had with the Ship Canal Company um, was um, we said that the site wouldn't um, achieve its potential unless the shooting ceased. We never thought they'd agree to that because these people were paying the money, but they did. And um, as soon as the, sh the shooting party left, very reluctantly, I have to say, um, the next winter, the teal numbers, which had peaked at 400, had quadrupled. And the next winter, there was 1,600 teal there, and they continued to go up. Um, we were still managing in a very low-key way, as money allowed. We were young then, we could go down, pull out reeds and reed mace and create more open water. Um, but um, it was fairly low key. Um, and we only did work, as I say, when money became available. Um, the site was designated um, an SSSI in 19, October 85 for the wintering wildfowl numbers. And by then, as the water had started to increase in acreage and we flooded out the, um, the reed mace, um, the duck numbers went up and up and up and uh, we were getting nationally num important numbers of teal, um, shoveler um, and potchard as well. Um, so that was just for wintering wildfowl. The SSSI was um, revised in 2004 to include breeding assemblages of uh, wildfowl, of, uh, of, of birds in general, including the black neck grebe, which you see there. Um, the black neck grebes arrived after the initial designation um, for wildfowl, but um, they quickly increased. Um, but unfortunately, when 19, by 1990, 1991, the Ship Canal Company um, decided after having, receiving an engineer's report that they, they would have no choice but to drain that water completely. And the black neck grebes had just got really established then and this looked like a disaster. Um, in spite of interventions by English Nature, Natural England um, and the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, um, it just went ahead, the drainage. Um, the grebes came back each year to what tiny little pools re remained. They were obviously very site faithful, but moved off to other sites in Greater Manchester and in the west of Warrington and bred there. Um, a lot of bird watchers stopped coming because we were we issued permits because the ship canal didn't want people wandering all over the site. Um, and a lot of permit holders stopped coming and thought the site was finished. Um, but it's really interesting this because it, it, um, it bears on what Ashley's going to say in a minute that after about four or five years um, all the drainage channels to drain the bed silted up and the water started coming back and um, with it the black neck reeves came back and a lot of other birds came back um, but on this question of rotating wetlands the five six years that it had been dry when it reflooded, it became incredibly productive. Um, in, in, aquatic invertebrates had increased, plants had, had grown, and they were they were inundated. And the black neck grebe numbers then took off, um, as many other species, breeding species did. And um, it uh, the in 19, 2002, I think that's right, isn't it, Ash? Um, I went down one day and was astonished to find on this number three deposit ground, which many of you know, 52 adult brachneck grebes, which I suspect is probably, almost certainly, the biggest number ever recorded in the breeding season in Britain. And that year, we had 20 pairs breed, which, if you don't know much about black neck grebes, the national population has never, breeding population has never been above 50 pairs for the whole of UK. So we had half the national population on that water. Um, and it stayed very productive for a number of years. But as wetlands 
as it grows with wetlands, the, um, the productivity starts to tail off after a number of years. And the population is now levelled off at about 8 to 10 pairs. But it's still one of the most important breeding sites for them in the UK. Um, and for other birds too, like um, Potchard. This, this, this last breeding season in 2017, we had 19 broods of Potchard. And the rare breeding panel tell me that the latest figures from 2015, there's only about 300 to 500 pairs in the whole of the country. So it's a very significant population of potchard. <coughs> so these two very rare, one, one grebe and one potchard. Also important for butterflies, dragonflies and amphibians. And one of the things, as I said before, that we've done is record, record, record. And we produce an annual report every year, which is now coming up to our 40th annual report next year, I think. Um, and it's, it's getting up to four, uh, 90, 95 pages, our annual report. So this mass is related, not just about birds, but about butterflies, dragonflies, amphibians. Wollstone could be designated as an SSSI for the amphibian um, numbers there. Great crested newts, masses of them. Um, I think we heard that the population at Wollstone was probably the second highest in the, in the whole country. Um, when they did some work on the east side of the viaduct on number one bed, um, the numbers that were found in the, in the trapping, I think they got about 3,000 great crested newts of that order. N enormous numbers. Um, so it's very, very important um, for this. Now then, um, so where we've come up to, we have the next slide, Ash. Um, yeah. This is the, the aerial view of, of the site. Looking, I know you saw one before from the Thelwell Viaduct end. Um, that's, this is showing um, number four deposit ground, which is the one that the money from the... Um, carbon landscape scheme is going to be used for. Um, there is a, a little wetland that was created in the late 1990s in the bottom left hand corner there. Um, but the rest of the development is going to be in the, the bulk of the area down there. The size of that, the wetland will be um, a series of pools which I shall tell you all about in a minute. Um, and um, that is going to cover something like 100 acres in two, well it'll be three cells, the one that's already there and two others um, and the hope will be that we will also create the habitat which will bring the um, black neck grebes over onto that bed as well because although they have bred on other parts of the site it's been very very rare for them to breed elsewhere but we'll probably also need to bring across the black headed gulls because one of the um, key ingredients for black neck greaves is the presence of breeding black headed gulls. Um, and that's really because they, they give them warning of um, any danger um, and any threats. And they, they'll, they'll, mink, for example, they just hover over mink and uh, chase off birds like marsh harriers, unfortunately, which might stay to breed otherwise. Um, but that's where we're up to with, with that. And, um, I'll pass over to Ash now to uh, go on to the actual um, development of the wetland. So we've got a good view there of the whole of Wollstone Ice. You've got bed one off in the distance, bed two past the M6, and okay. bed three where we currently do a majority of our management is where the black neck grebes are currently breeding. And as, as Brian mentioned in the foreground is bed four. Separate beds, cells, areas in a rotation where you're not continually chipping away, trying to keep reed beds young. As anyone who manages wetlands know, it's a constant wrestle to maintain a young reed bed that's good for wildlife. And that, that involves a lot of expensive management from truck saws to excavators, to just getting out there with a brush cutter and volunteers. Um, so rotational wetland management is a little bit more drastic in the sense that you'll have um, a maturing, a mature and a, a, a fallow uh, cell 
and have it on like a cycle of about seven years. Um, as Brian Martin mentioned, in 91, the beds were drained, unfortunately, by the uh, ship canal company. And that completely dried up the bed and they, they came, but they subsequently left. Which gave us a bit of information that they were, they were willing to come to the same area and then not travel too far. I think af after the drainage of the beds, we saw the uh, first confirmed breeding in the Greater Manchester area. Um, and then at 95, the, uh, the channels became silted up and we saw a return of the wetland area to the beds. And from this stage, the black neck grebes quickly returned back and began breeding. And within seven years, which is the peak for wetlands <laughs> subsequently in 2002. That's when we saw the 52 black neck greaves and the 20 confirmed pairs breeding. So that's, that's the sort of thinking behind having different cells running on a seven year rotation with about two years between each sort of age that we want the, the beds to be. Um, so <laughs> being on the forefront of conservation, Wilson Eyes will be the first to sort of implement this nationally, which is quite exciting. So here's a really um, <laughs> dazzling picture and totally easy to understand if you've got no context whatsoever. Um, but you can see, I'll step up here if I've got the, enough cable. You can see this here is bed four as a whole and this is hopefully what we want to create out of what is now largely a plantation of giant hogweed with a good area at the top of about six areas of wetland that we still want to uh, transform into our more sort of shallow reef island wetland. Um, so the structure of the, uh, the cells themselves will be composed of a, a large uh, deep channel of about 700 millimetres running around the edge with a bit of uh, uh, grading on into a shelf of about 500 mil below water. And then these sort of islands that will be partly submerged, probably about 300 millimetres. The, once, once this sort of dramatic wiping of the area of what's there currently to re-wet, um, this will allow sort of early successional um, vegetation to become established. And this is where we sort of struggle in the UK to get ideal habitat for the black neck grebes because if you're not constantly maintaining that early successional stage that becomes too mature, the sites get uh, unproductive for the black neck grebes and it's something we fear for bed free. If we let it continue to mature, then um, it will become unsuitable and our pears will continue de to decline from the peak that was in 2002 where we had 20 pears. So as I said before these three cells here will be run on a uh, fallow maturing and um, mature sort of basis just before we we get in there and we take all the sort of mature trees, mature vegetation down and uh, um, flatten it back to sort of a more, we'll we be essentially emulating uh, the 15 year dredging rotations that the beds had seen in the past, but taking it to a more optimal seven year rotation. Uh, so in areas where we currently have suitable willow scrub, they'll be re uh, retained and excavated round and obviously by increasing, uh, bunding up the areas, we're allowed to fill them with water and improve their condition. Um, the area below the two cells at the bottom is a good willow scrub which will hopefully get in there, break up a bit, take out some of the more mature trees and then be able to control the wetness by having a, a sluice at the bottom of the left hand cell where we can control water going into that area. Um, as a whole this will hopefully benefit the black neck grebes and if we see them moving over into these cells, this will then allow us to completely drain bed free off into the distant future whenever we dare to do that and do some drastic management there. Um, so other than black neck greaves, this is going to be fantastic for reed warblers, sedge warblers, grasshopper warblers, um, 
the, the winter in wildfowl, the, the breed in potchard, and hopefully it'll be a, a really exciting project to get underway with, thanks to the Carbon Landscape Project. Thank you very much.